today on the Perception and Action Podcast. What is the best way to train multiple movements, like the serve, set, and pass in volleyball, in parallel? Are the effects we see when interleaving different movements more consistent with an information processing or an ecological approach to skill? So it's time for a call to action. Hi, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25-year journey as a researcher, professor, and high-performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. Before we get to today's topic, I want to tell you about a couple extra things that might interest you if you're enjoying the podcast. First, my book, How We Learn to Move, A Revolution in the Way We Coach and Practice Sports Skills, is now available in audiobook format. You can find it on Audible or Amazon. Second, if you're interested in working directly with me, I currently have openings in my monthly mentorship program. This includes monthly Zoom meetings, either one-on-one or with your staff, analysis of your practice designs, and a monthly group discussion with coaches and instructors from a range of different sports. To find out more, please go to patreon.com forward slash perception action. Now on to the show. Hi everyone, this is Rob Gray from ASU and the Perception Action Podcast back with another article review. The article we're going to look at today focuses on learning multiple movements or multiple skills in parallel. And of course, this is a very well-studied topic in motor learning, right? We're going to get into the variability of practice kind of literature. Um, what, but I think there's a kind of interesting new twist on this. So obviously what we're asking here is what happens when we practice multiple skills, right? So if we, and we're practicing golf, if we switch between practicing driving, chipping, and putting, right? And we do these in parallel. How should we structure this? Are there benefits or, or negatives of, to doing this? You know, as I said, there's a long history of, of work on this area. It's been one of the most popular topics studied in, in, um, in motor learning. And it can be understood from either of the skill acquisition approaches, right? Either from an information processing approach or an ecological approach. And I have a whole page devoted to this where um, perceptionaction.com forward slash VP, where I go into all the, the variability of practice issues and talk about you know, the terminology and the different theories. So, so if you want a little more background, please check that out. So within an information processing approach to variable practice, of course, the main kind of guiding idea we're talking about here is contextual interference, right? So the idea here in the information processing view is you're building a pro- motor program for each of the skills. I'm building a motor program for chipping and driving, right? Um, this involves, right, the classic Fitz and Posner idea. We're holding steps and working memory. We're building proceduralized knowledge. We're in Schmidt's terms, we're parameterizing our motor program, all this going on. If we mix in another skill with that, what we're doing is essentially causing interference at the level of working memory, right? The steps involved in, in putting are different than, or in chipping are very different than those involved in driving, right? The kind of, the, what you want to do. The, 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 the criteria for the ideal correct solution is different for both of those. So when I'm practicing, they're kind of, kind of interfere with each other and they're going to cause um, forgetting they're going to cause me to reconstruct. Like every time I switch back from putting to chipping, I'm going to have to reconstruct my motor program. And they might cause a, also elaboration of the motor program, right? Fig- I might figure out how parameter um, to do shots between uh, chipping and driving, right? So that's the idea of elaboration, okay? But there's two fundamental things we should see based on the idea of contextual interference. First of all, you should struggle during the acquisition phase and at the kind of final post-test, you know, because of all this interference going on and, and, you know, you're going to develop a less effective motor program for the one skill than if you just practice that skill alone, right? And we see that in classic variability practice research. This is the difference between blocked versus random practice, right? When we allow you to practice the same skill over and over, you typically acquire it faster and maybe are a little bit better at the end of skill skill acquisition training um, than if we do random practice where we're switching and we're causing all this interference. So interference is going to cause acquisition to be slower and poorer performance. 
but we're playing the long game here, right? And we're trying to, the reason we're going through all this trouble and creating all this chaos for you is that, that with the idea that in the retention phase later on and specific and particularly in transfer phases where we practice chip shots, maybe that you didn't practice before, we'd expect a much better performance because you're going to have a more elaborate motor program, right? That allows for, for making adjustments for different situations to the, the, to the, the technique for chipping, for example. Some key points here though, right? Although we're using variability in practice, right? We're not, it's a, for a very different reason, right? We're not using it to promote self-organization, right? What we're using, you know, I call this in my book and I've talked about this many times, we're, we're shooting for adjustability, not adaptability, right? We're, want, we're still focused on one, the one ideal technique where then we're gonna teach you how to adjust it for a downhill lie and an uphill lie. And this is a quote from the paper. This is, by the way, this is a paper by Wolfgang Schorhorn and colleagues we're going to talk about today. Regardless of this transfer in the recommended randomized practice sequence, the movements were always precisely defined and had to be performed correctly and according to the description of a prototype, right? So in classic variability of practice research where we're looking at random versus blocked or whatever, and we're talking about contextual interference, the, the prescriptive coaching is being used, right? In almost all of those studies, right? They're, they're getting, here's the way you do it. When they switch to talking about chipping, they're telling you how to chip, okay? And even in a lot of cases, we're telling you how to make the adjustments to the chipping shot for doing downhill or downhill lie, for example. The problem with this, you know, when I've talked about this, for example, in episode 91, there's some limitations with this kind of generalization of the variability of practice. One is it doesn't seem to hold very well when you get to more complex skills, right? When it's tested in actual sporting environments where there's multiple degrees of freedom to coordinate, you don't see this really super clear distinction between um, block versus random, for example. It doesn't seem to, the effect does not seem to be as strong for performers of different ages, younger performers and lower skill levels, right? And that, so that's something, you know, we, I talked about before. The other issue is there's really not a lot of guidance within the contextual interference idea of what constitutes a skill, right? And this is something I talk about a lot when I talk about variability of practice, how people confound a uh, block versus random and constant versus variable, right? And if you could go back to that page I mentioned, block versus random is truly, if you really want to follow the true description, it's when you're switching skills, right? Chipping and driving. It's not when you just do different variants of the skill. So when you take basketball shots from different distances, that's not changing the skill, right? That's varying uh, the same skill. So, so that's kind of, and, and then there's kind of a gray area in between, you know, what, you know, if you, if I do a hook shot versus a jump shot from different distances, is that a different skill? So there's not a lot of guidance in the, in the theory of, um, you know, the contextual interference idea of what you should be varying, right? Am I going to get the same results if I interleave pitching a baseball with chipping as if I do chipping and driving, Right. In some theories, you should, right? You're just causing interference with the same body parts and the same mechanics. How similar do the things need to be to cause um, interference? Is it just kind of superficial similarity? Do they just have all the same body parts, kind of same movement patterns, and so on? So there's not a lot of talk about these issues, and this is something that um, th in this paper they bring up in the introduction. Um so here's a quote from the paper, whether the phenomenological similarity is the critical criteria or it's a similarity of the underlying biomechanical force characteristics and the connection with the neurologic control mechanisms or some other dimension. So we don't know really, there's not much discussion about, about this at all. The alternative, of course, is the ecological approach to understanding the variability of practice and interleaving multiple skills. You know, we could think of this from a constraint sled approach. We're going to get into more issues of like degeneracy from an ecological dynamics approach. Or I'm going to focus here, you know, because this is what was going to look at in this paper, differential learning, right? So differential learning is the idea that interleaving multiple skills like chipping and driving is causing noise in the motor system because you're getting different, you're adding uh, variability to the practice conditions, which is causing noise, which induces potentially stochastic resonance. We're covering more of the solution space, right? We're getting you to try more different things. Critically, when we're using variability, right, in, in differential learning and all the other ecological approaches, we're going for adaptability, not adjustability, right? We're not trying to teach you a correct technique when we switch, right? We're not telling you anything about the technique. We're using the variability to let the technique emerge on your own. 
Um, also talked a lot about in this paper, you know, uh, Schulhorn's, some of his work is a lot of neuro, neuroscience aspects of this. And he talks about when you switch from prescriptive coaching, uh, re, uh, strict repetition, et cetera, you deact kind of get the pr prefrontal cortex less involved, right? You're thinking less about the steps involved and making sure I have the correct technique um, and having less control over that. This minds me in a way of, of kind of some of the ideas of errorless learning, for example, where if I don't produce errors, then I don't kind of hypothesis test about, about what's doing on. So when differential learning, right, because it's so chaotic and variable, you can't really think, oh, I need to do this to do that, right? You just kind of have to react because <laughs> you really, there's so many changes going on. There's no way you could think, okay, here's how I make this adjustment when he's making me stand on one foot and close my right eye, right? It's too, too much going on. Um, so that that's kind of the idea. So the the two different skill acquisition approaches have different descriptions for what why interleaving might be beneficial and why it might help. A key difference here is, well, and we'll talk about this in specific hypotheses, is that in the ecological approach, right, we're not really, um, especially in differential learning, like Schulhorn argues, there's going to be no really a decrement in acquisition, right? Um, it, because uh, in particular at the end of training, we shouldn't see because we shouldn't see a, de uh, uh, a decrement in the post-test performance as compared to block practice and prescriptive coaching, right? Because there's no m interference going on. There's, that's not involved in this idea at all of interference from working memory. Okay, so here's the paper I want to talk about today. Again, Wolfgang Schulhorn's work. Wow, they're, they're putting out a lot of great work now. They, I'll show you at the end. They just have another golf putting study, uh, go golf study on on differential learning that I'll talk about soon. So learning multiple movements in parallel accurately in random order. That's going to be the contextual interference, uh, inter information processing approach, right? So we're going to use randomized practice, but we're going to focus on accurate making correct movements or just adding noise, which is the differential learning approach. Okay, so they're going to compare the effects of contextual interference and differential learning approach. The skill they're focusing on, sport we're focusing on here is volleyball, which, uh, which is interesting. It's one of the first studies I've seen in using ecological approach in volleyball that's been published. Um, there's some others, but in, in, in specifically one that compares it to other training methods. So the hypothesis from an information processing perspective should be that both um, contextual interference and differential learning approaches are going to cause worse acquisition and worse post-test performance because making you do all these different movements instead of letting you practice, for example, overhead serve over and over again, repeat the movement, is going to take longer to develop the motor, the motor program, the correct technique. Um, they're going to expect lower performance. Remember, this is from the information processing perspective. What should we predict? Differential learning is going to be lower because we're going to get you to do a lot of weird movements, right? We're going to make you throw the ball higher, throw the ball lower, uh, run to do a jump serve, you start with your feet wide, hop off one leg, do all these different things, right? So we're not giving you a chance to learn the correct technique, right? We're, you're going to have fewer correct, accurate repetitions, so you should be worse. Significantly fewer correct repetition of the target exercises. And we're going to, but in the long run, we probably expect better performance in both contextual interference and DLA due to working memory interference, right? There's going to be more elaboration of the, the motor program, uh, forget, you know, reconstruction, all those, these kind of ideas. From an EP perspective, ecological approach perspective, the better performance should be through the differential learning group throughout, <laughs> right? All phases of the experiment because it promotes self-organization, allows you to gain this kind of knowledge of the solution space that lets you extrapolate and interpolate when you're given a new situation, and this idea of downshifting the control of the prefrontal cortex. Okay, so let's see what they actually did. So they took uh, 36 university uh, students that were advanced beginners. So they, they played some volleyball. <coughs> they were split into three groups, a contextual interference group, a differential learning group, and a control group. And they trained two times a week for six weeks. The control group was some uh, kind of strange here. You know, it's always tough picking, deciding what control group they picked. But what they did was um, practice completely non- related sports skills. Well, not, you know, there's some similarities, but they're not volleyball. 
right? They're catching and bo- throwing smaller balls or aiming at a target with ball. So if you could think of it, they're playing baseball. <laughs> if, you, if you, they probably weren't, but you know, so they're playing a different sport that involves some of the same kind of movements and things, but it's not the same. I think we would have been, been able to make a bit more sense out of this if we had a, a control group that, you know, just um, either did regular volleyball practice or very blocked practice of volleyball skills, something like that. But anyway, that's that's what they use. OK, um, the control the contextual interference groups, they're going to have exactly prescribed. That's the words from the paper skills in random order. So they're going to do overhand serves, uh, volleying and underhand passes. Right. And they're going to do they're going to have high contextual interference. So they're going to have a serve, for example, practice a serve. And I can't remember how many um, they did a few repetitions in each of these. So they're going to do like five serves in which a coach is standing there saying, oh, no, your elbow's too, you're low, throw the ball higher, and so on. Then they're going to move to uh, underhand passes. We, I call it bumping. Um, they're going to do that for a few repetitions with correction. So they're they're working towards the ideal technique for each of these three skills in a situation with lots of shifting between practicing the skills in random order. So it's classic random practice, basically, that you would see in a lot of other studies. The differential learning training group, um, what they're going to do is they're going to practice the same three skills, but under constantly changing variations, like we've seen in all the kind of studies of, of classic, uh, you know, differential learning now. Every time you do a movement, it's going to be different than any one you've been done before. And critically, we're not going to give you any uh, instructions, right? So about the correct technique. So there's going to, I don't know if you can see this, but there's going to be variations in trunk movement. You're going to look up, look down. You know, um, elbows bent, elbows extended, knees uh, standing position, so on. So we're going to have all these different variants of positions and movements that we're going to uh, ask the person to do on each execution. But again, they're going to be doing these around these three basic skills, right? So you're still going to be overhand serving, vol- underhand passing, and volleying. But uh, we're going to do around those, we're going to do different variants of positions to invoke differential learning, Right. So critically, we're not trying to teach you the correct technique for serving. We're trying to make you serve in a different way every single time so that you can self-organize. And that's the idea. And then there's going to be pre-post and retention tests, right, of the skills. Basically, they're on the court receiving a pass from a teammate and trying to do whatever, serve, volley or whatever into a target on the floor. And they're given different points for whether they how close they are to the target. Um, the retention test was one week after training. Okay, so that's a pretty basic design, as I said. Um, I think well designed, other than, you know, I would do have done a different control group. But anyway, here's the results, okay? So the results, what they found was that for all the skills in all the phase, pretty much all the phases other than the pretest. So pretest, the groups were similar, which is what you want, right? In terms of pass performance. Um, they also did a combined score for the, the all the passes. All three groups were similar in the pretest. In the post-test and the retention, the differential learning group, they improved from the pretest in all the skills, and their level of performance was consistently higher than the other two groups, right? So they didn't show any of the decrement in, during the acquisition phase in the post-test, and they showed the benefit in the retention phase. The constraints, the contextual interference group um, did not kind of, they had some things where they were better than the control group, particularly for the overhand pass. But in other ones, there was no significant difference and they didn't show, you know, consistently significant improvement. So the bottom line is that differential learning was the best, right? Clearly, that led to the best performance results um, in the in this study. Um, so... In terms of the actual discussion in the paper, the results of the training are multiple skills are most consistent with differential learning theory. Um, there was no evidence of interference, right? There's no evidence that the differential learning made you worse in the um, at the post-test, which you expect based on the idea of interference and working memory that's in contextual interference in the name itself, right? Interference, better performance throughout. Um, even if you look at the contextual interference group, it, the pattern was not as expected relative to the control group. They were not worse in the acquisition phase and not better in the retention phase for all the different skills, which is consistent with what we talked about before. When you're talking about coordination of move, uh, complex movements, sometimes you don't get the classic uh, contextual interference effects. This is somewhat difficult to interpret, again, because of the control group, right? We don't have the classic blocked practice control group to compare it to. Okay? 
Um, I think this is, in terms of, you know, I think this is a really nice, again, another really nice study by this group, Wolfgang Shorter Cohen's group. You know, sometimes, you know, I, I'll talk, show you in a second. I'm, I'm keeping a running tab of evidence for support and support of using ecological approaches and skills in studies that compare to other, other approaches. And often, you know, people argue that the other approach, the traditional or prescriptive approach we're using for comparison is overly, uh, it's kind of a straw man. It's made to be ridiculously repetitive and uh, restrictive that no coach would ever do. So it's giving you this false benefit of the ecological approach. Well, I think from what I have read in this paper, and in contrast to what I've seen on a lot of volleyball courts, and I've done a fair amount in volleyball, it's pretty similar, right? This is not a fake train. Like interleaving skill, the interleaving is actually something that rarely occurs this much, but the, you know, the correction, and I don't, I would not consider this a straw man at all from what I've seen. Maybe people differ, <laughs> but I think it's really getting hard to keep uh, keep pulling that out as a reason why the ecological approaches keep showing benefits in all these studies. I, I, I don't think that holds water at all uh, myself. Um, it's my discussion, my points. Um, one of the things that challenges, I have a few challenges with the, the differential learning. Um, one of them is... And similar to the critique that the authors made at the start of the introduction about contextual interference, I find it kind of hard to understand what variations to use and when, right, in differential learning. Is it just anything goes, which sometimes it seems like it, right? You have people doing pirouettes before they take off in speed skating. Or is there some logic to what choices you make, right? What you vary and when. And there is a little bit, you know, depends on the skill level and the groups I've talked about it before. I'll leave you to read this paper. There is some, you know, they talk a little bit about how they decided what to vary in terms of the volleyball serve. And, and, you know, so there is a little bit, but we still need a lot more of that, right? So there's some secret sauce about differential learning that is not being conveyed well, in my opinion, right? So such that I could go out and use it and get the same benefits that the, that we find in these studies. And th I've used it in a couple of my studies and found that it's beneficial, um, but I, I, I'm not quite as much as is found in some of these studies because I don't think I know what what conditions to use. And, and I've been told actually been told in emails from people that I, I depict the wrong ones. Um, so, so that's one point. The other thing I find challenging, you know, I've, I, work, you know, a fairly high level athletes, I mean, very high level athletes a lot. And um, it, trying to implement an extreme version of differential learning, like it's learned, used in this, where you have people doing one foot and eye closed and do, 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 I find it a really hard sell, right? Right. Telling a really skilled athlete to all, all these crazy things has very limited tolerance, <laughs> right? So I would love to hear people's thoughts on their experiences with this if they come up with ways to do it. So I use differential learning a lot, but in a much scaled down version. I like to combine it with a very differential learning kind of along a limited number of dimensions um, rather than doing this kind of full extreme version. And then finally, I'll point out, I already talked about this a little bit already, this is adding another study that adds to the growing body of evidence in support of the ecological approach, right? So if people ask you, what proof do you have that ecological approach works? Send them to this page, perceptionaction.com forward slash comparative. Here's what I'm doing. I'm keeping a running tally of studies that make direct comparison between a differential learning uh, ecological approach, like differential learning or the constraints of that approach and um, the, uh, the some other typically a prescriptive or repetitive training. And you can see now there's 14 different studies. The 13th one is the one I just talked about, volleyball. The Scholhorn's group has another one on golf, a really interesting one that looks at um, the effect of differential learning on different skill levels. Um, I'll review, be reviewing that shortly. But you can see when we have shot put, speed skating, soccer, tennis, baseball, weightlifting, um, some S&C type movements, volleyball and golf across a wide range of sports now. We have 14 studies, um, 12 of them, uh, other than the ha two Hosner studies, which, you know, Shulhorn has pointed out some in, you know, problems with those. 12 out of the 14 studies have shown clear benefits for the ecological approach, right? 
So I could, uh, would contend, that, and especially since how long we've been testing this, look, like other than the initial Schulhorn study, the first set of, the bulk of studies have been started really in 2010. So we're talking about 12 years. In 12 years, we have uh, basically uh, you know, 13 studies. That That's pretty good, right? That's a lot. For, it takes a long time to do research and get it published. So that's a pretty good body of evidence. So I would you know, argue that we're really saying there's no evidence or we need to do more work. It's starting to, you know, okay, we always need to do more work, but you know, it's really starting to be pretty convincing to me. I know I'm biased, but I think it's pretty convincing. So please check out perceptionaction.com forward slash comparative, where I have a links to all those papers, and I'll keep adding to this as I see new ones. And if anyone sees one I'm missing, please let me know. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Uh, thanks for joining me. Um, cheers for now, and keep them coupled. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at Rob Gray at ASU.edu or follow me on Twitter at ShakeyWaits. To find out more about the podcast, please check out PerceptionAction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including written transcripts, please head over to Patreon.com forward slash PerceptionAction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled.